Okay, this is a little video to try and help with your vision for energy stores and pathways. So you should be going through the booklet I've given you or your teacher's given you um, to try and answer some of the questions on this. So the first part of the video is going to help you go through the basic stuff. So filling in the equations and filling in the descriptions of the energy stores and pathways and some examples. And the second part is going to be going through some more difficult questions. So an extended written answer as well as a more difficult calculation question so first off i'm going to go through just each of our energy stores in turn and look at the equation the description of what it is and what different things can be examples of it so if we start with kinetic energy so kinetic energy is the energy an object has due to its motion so it is affected by two things the mass and the speed but not in the same way so it's affected proportionally by the mass and this comes down to the equation so basically because it's just the mass if we double the mass we double the energy okay so if you have a car driving along and it has a trailer on the back of it which is the same mass as the car the car will have double the kinetic energy but it's affected by the speed squared so this is because the speed squared because we square the velocity or the speed now if you then double the speed of something so if you've got a person running and you double that person's speed they don't double their energy they quadruple their energy okay a person on a bike goes three times the speed they were going they now have nine times the amount of energy so increasing the speed increases the energy by whatever you square that number now moving on to examples then really quickly so i've talked through these so we've got a car a runner a person on a bike now this can be anything that's moving from a ball flying across a room or an elastic band flying across a room or anything up to a rocket or a plane and obviously the bigger the thing is and the faster it's going the more energy it's going to have now on our equation we've got kinetic energy which is the symbol for that is ek so e capital E for energy and the little k subscript uh, denoting that it's kinetic energy not any other type of energy which is measured in joules equals 0 0.5 which is always 0 0.5 okay so just a constant we're going to have in there times mass which uh, symbol is m lowercase and measured in kilograms which is kg times velocity squared so it's a v squared for the symbol and meters per second m slash s for the units okay so uh, obviously we need to make sure if we want in an answer in joules we need the mass to be in kilograms okay and we need the speed to be in meters per second we need to make sure if it's in grams we need to convert it into kilograms and meters per second should usually be right all right moving on so elastic energy so it is the energy an object has when it's stretched or squashed or when an object has changed shape okay so if an object changes shape it will um, change its amount of elastic energy uh, it's affected proportionally by the spring constants so just like with kinetic energy with the mass it's always affected by the same amount by the spring constant and it, if you double the spring constant you double the energy and it's affected by the extension squared so if you double the extension you're actually quadrupling the energy just like with the velocity in the uh, kinetic energy equation very similar equations you get this one given to you as well on your um exam sheet so your uh, data sheet that you get given to you in your exams you get this given to you right examples of elastic bands and springs are mo the most common examples or it could be something like a rope that stretches anything that stretches a little bit can be that um it can be anything though that changes shape at all so like a ruler being bent now another example they like to put in there is a ball so as a ball is falling and it hits the ground it can change shape so it hits the ground in a perfect sphere but it squashes as it hits the ground now that's then stored elastic energy for that split second that, that ball hits the ground it's storing elastic energy and then as it goes back to its original shape it's going to push the ball back up again okay so transferring back to kinetic energy again now uh, let's go through the equation really quickly so elastic energy so it's big e for 
capital E for energy with a little e to show it's elastic. Uh, measured in joules equals 0 0.5 times spring constant, which is a K for the symbol times extension square, which is in little e, lowercase e, um, for the extension. Now, just quickly on the units on this, we've got newtons per meter and meters. Okay, so spring constant and extension respectively. But we could have for this, instead of newtons per meter, newtons per centimeter. And therefore, we'd want the extension in centimeters or newtons per millimeter. And then we want the extension in millimeters. So whatever you've got, the spring constant in, you want your extension in that as well, and vice versa. So if you've been given one that need, that can't change, or you you say if your answer get asked to give an answer in newtons per centimeters, but your extension's in millimeters, you need to convert something there. Okay, moving on to thermal energy. So. Thermal energy is the energy an object has due to the movement of the particles. So as you heat something up, the particles inside it, so if it's a solid, they vibrate more, and in a liquid and a gas, they will move faster. And the average amount of energy that those particles have, we measure as the temperature. So the higher, and this now comes on to the amount of thermal energy something has, the higher the temperature, okay, the more thermal energy you, you've got, the higher the mass of the object, the more thermal energy you've got. And the higher the specific heat capacity, the more thermal energy you've got. Now I'll go into a bit more detail on specific heat capacity in another video looking at particle model, but for now, it's just the amount of energy needed to heat one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And it's a, a number that every material will have. So they're all proportional, which means just if you double any of these, the mass, specific heat capacity or temperature change, you double the amount of thermal energy you've got. Um, moving on to examples, basically anything that is hot will have thermal energy. So things like ovens, hot water, thermal energy. So if you're heating up an oven using an electrical pathway or you're heating up a kettle of water or you're heating up a Bunsen burner using, using a Bunsen burner, sorry, to heat up a glass of water, the water has thermal energy stored inside it. Um, also, one to really know, it's often the energy that's wasted due to friction. Okay, so in the, you can see here in this car, friction between the brake discs and the brakes has caused thermal energy to build up in the brakes to the point where you can see them glowing red hot. And that will then dissipate into the environment. And another example, go back to your kettle. If you're heating up that kettle, this, yes, there's going to be a good, a useful thermal store inside the kettle, but some of the, the thermal energy is also going to escape into the atmosphere and heat up the air around you a little bit. Um, so you're often wanting to stop thermal energy by either, um, so obviously you don't want to lubricate the brakes, but lubrication, which means putting something in there to stop friction. So in the wheel bearings inside the car, you'd lubricate those to stop friction or insulation, so in the kettle, if you made a cup of tea from that, you'd put some insulation around the cup of tea to stop the heat from escaping from there. Now, onto your equation. So it's thermal energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. So thermal energy is capital E for energy and little t for thermal. Mass is M and specific heat capacity is C, capital C and temperature change is this little greek letter here it's a greek letter theta okay uh, and that just means temperature change rather than just temperature so to work out the temperature change as well okay we would have to do something to that um, so if we wanted to work out the temperature change we'd have to do the start and temperature take away the sorry take the start temperature from the end temperature so you do end take away start temperature. So you measure the temperature at the start, temperature at the end, and take them away from each other. So that's something you often have to do in an equation. You might be given uh, some water has been heated from 20 degrees to 60 degrees. So your temperature change, you work that out. 60 at the end, take away 20 as the start, gives you 40 degrees altogether. Um, right, through the units then. Energy still measured in joules, always will be. Mass measured in kilograms. So if it's in grams, you need to convert that. Um, specific heat capacity is joules per kilogram degrees C. So as, as I said, when I described what that was, 
is the amount of energy needed to heat one kilogram by one degree C. So energy per kilogram per degree C. So they both go on the bottom with the energy on top. Okay, moving on to gravitational potential energy. So this is the energy an object has due to its position in a gravitational field. So that's a little bit complicated, but what that means is basically it's an energy an object has due to how far it is from the center of gravity of something else. So on normally this means on planet Earth, how far away is the thing from the ground, the object from the ground? So the further higher up you move it from the ground, the more energy it's got. Okay, so that's the first thing that affects this. It's all of these are proportional, so it all means that if you double them, it gets doubled. So if you double the height, you double the amount of gravitational energy. Also, it's affected by the mass. So the bigger an object is, the more gravitational energy it has. And both of those make sense. If you want to lift something up, if you lift it twice as high, it takes twice as much effort. If the thing's twice as heavy, twice as much mass, it takes twice as much effort. And also, it's affected proportionally by the gravitational field strength. So that is the strength of gravity on the planet that you're on. So on Earth, that is 10 newtons per kilogram. Kilogram. Okay, so on Earth, gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. Let's change that colour. Um, and that's a, a fixed for Earth. Or, if you're doing paper 2, it's got to be 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So that's just the 10 is just the rounded up version that's often given to you. If it's given as 9.8, use 9.8. If it's given as 10, use 10. If in doubt, probably go for 9.8, okay, uh, rather than rounding it up. So if you're on Earth and every one kilogram of mass you lift up it takes 9.8 newtons if you go to the moon that's more like 1.6 newtons for every kilogram on mars it's more like 3.2 but as you get to a bigger planet like jupiter it's a much higher value than that i think it's 26 point something so if you double again if you doubled the gravitational field strength you double the amount of energy it takes to lift something up Okay, so moving on to the examples. So anything which is higher up in the sky has got gravitational energy. So if you hold a ball in your hand, because it's off the ground, it's got gravitational energy more than if it's on the on the floor. But this is all about more than or less than, because nothing's ever got no gravitational energy. That's important to know, because nothing's at, ever going to be at the center of the Earth. Okay, it's if it's on the floor, it's still got some gravitational energy. It's just not able to go through the floor. Books on a shelf, really good example. They have gravitational energy. They could fall, and this is what all about what energy stores are. It could do something. So we've talked about thermal energy already. The thermal energy stored in there could heat something else up. Books on a shelf could fall off. Elastic band stretched could fly across the room. It's not doing anything. Books on a shelf aren't doing anything. This is like it's kind of the prime example to explain this. They'll stay there forever or until the shelf breaks but they could fall off they could do something a skydiver another example when it's up in the sky has gravitational energy one thing to kind of not get too caught up on on this though as i've said everything has some gravitational energy but mentioning it's not always the best idea if it's clear that it's a car driving along the road and you say oh it's gravitational energy because it's not at the center of the earth that's that's wonderful that you know that but it's not going to get you any marks it obviously wants you to say it's kinetic energy okay if a uh, beaker of water is being heated up and it's been put on a tripod above a bunsen burner you don't say it's got gravitational energy because it's been put on the tripod it's got thermal energy because you've heated it up so just think what they actually want you to say right equation so gravitational energy which our symbol is ep this time so it's energy we've already said capital e for energy lowercase p for potential so it's gravitational potential energy uh, and it's measured in joules again mass measured in kilograms so always want to be in kilograms and uh, m for mass gravity so it's a lowercase g for, for, for gravity here and that is measured in newtons per kilogram so as i mentioned up here how many newtons to lift one kilogram also just on back to these numbers uh, just briefly um 
they are ex something you're expected to know. So you're expected to know that gravity on Earth is either 10 rounded or 9.8 unrounded uh, newtons per kilogram. Um, height is measured in meters, okay, and its symbol is h in this case. So obviously we always want height and mass are the ones that you're going to have to convert most often. If you've got your height in millimeters, change it to meters. If your height's in kilometers because it's a skydiver and the two kilometers off the ground, change it to meters. Okay, always need to keep those in the correct units. Okay, moving on to chemical energy now. Um, so chemical energy is the energy stored between bonds in molecules. So that basically means it's the energy stored in the chemical bonds that hold things together. So this links into some of the stuff that you've done in chemistry. Because basically any time you have a chemical reaction and it gives out energy, so if you think about what type of a reaction gives out energy, you should know from chemistry, it's like an exothermic reaction, that means it's releasing chemical energy. But chem so a lot of things have chemical energy stored in them that don't look like they've got any energy. So for example, uh, any sort of fuel, so I've got fossil fuels here as an example, but you could have wood or paper even, anything that can burn, uh, anything combustible. They all have chemical energy stored inside them. So they're not doing anything. When it's a lump of coal by itself, it's tempting to go, all oh, right, coal, if you think about it, it's got thermal energy stored inside it because it, it burns. But right now, looking at that picture, that coal's got no, well, it has got some thermal energy because everything else, but it's not right now got any thermal energy stored inside it because it's just not doing anything. Okay, it has got loads of chemical energy stored inside it. The energy between the bonds that make up the coal, between the hydrocarbons that make up the coal, the oil, the gas, that's tons and tons of, chem of chemical energy stored inside there. And it's the same for your food as well. It doesn't do anything right now, but if you eat it, digest it, and extract the carbohydrates, okay, the and then turn those into glucose that you can use for respiration, which we've got down here. Now this at the bottom here, that is the respiration equation. So this is respiration. So this is a chemical reaction, which means that your your body, anybody's body, any person doing anything has a chemical energy stored inside them because it comes from their food. So when you're talking about a person doing something, the energy transfer is going to start off as a chemical store in their body um, or in their food or in their arm if they're lifting something. Uh, and this chemical reaction, I know it's not balanced, but I'm sure you can do it yourselves. This chemical reaction allows the energy to be released. So here, when it's breaking up the, uh, the glucose using oxygen into carbon dioxide and water, in the middle, we're releasing some energy here. Right, just really quickly on our other different energy stores that we've not that we don't need to go into too much detail about. So we've got electrostatic and magnetic, both very similar. So electrostatic is energy stored due to opposing or same electrical charges. So if you have a positive and a negative charge, they will attract to each other. And because of say if you're holding this balloon here, the balloon wants to go to the positive charge, so you're stopping it. And just like with a magnet, if you hold these two north and south poles apart from each other, they want to attract. So there's an energy store there because they want they if you let them go, they will do that. If you hold together a north and a north pole, they will push each other away. Um, same with positive and positive charge or negative and negative charge. Um, so examples of electrostatic charge stored in like a balloon that's rubbed against something. Uh, stored in static electricity, like in a Van de Graaff generator. Now, these things are unlikely to come. This is unlikely to come up on a normal paper one combined science t uh, physics test. It's more likely to come up on a triple test because of the fact that you've got you've got to do electrostatic um, static electricity. Sorry. Anyway, it might come up more often. Magnetic, again, it's not likely as likely to come up on paper one, but energy stores can come up on paper two. So you've got to be ready for that because you do about magnets on paper two. So you need to be ready to talk about maybe a magnetic store and two magnets are held together, going to a kinetic store as they push each other apart. So similar to electrostatic, it's the energies stored due to, a magnetic is the energy stored due to an object's position within a magnetic field. 
So if you, every magnet has its own magnetic field, okay? So quickly just draw a magnet. Uh, so we've got just your north and your south pole. So you might not have done this yet, but I'll quickly show you. You might have, you have a, a magnetic field around there, which goes from north to south, from north to south, like this. And we have field lines coming all the way around. This is really badly drawn, but anyway, okay, all the way around there, all the way around the top and the bottom. Okay, now if I put something that is magnetic, like a block of iron, so I'll call it Fe for iron. Okay, so if I put some iron somewhere around there, okay, in that magnetic field, it'll be attracted towards it. And again, if I hold it away, I can store that energy because it wants to go there. It can do that. And again, we've talked this before, it can do something. So it's very similar actually to gravitational energy, but on a smaller scale because gravity is such a weak force, it has to be a massive thing like a planet to have gravity, whereas magnets can be quite small and still attract things towards them. Right, um, last one then is nuclear energy. So it's the energy stored within the nucleus of an atom. So again, this is more likely to be on a triple paper because you do nuclear fusion and fission. So fusion is when you split an atom apart to release energy and you make smaller elements and release three more neutrons. Um, and this happens inside nuclear power plants and nuclear bombs, nuclear explosions. Nuclear uh, fusion, did I say fission for that? If I didn't, I meant fission for that one. Nuclear fusion is when you join two smaller atoms together to make a larger atom. So in the sun, hydrogen atoms are constantly being fused together to make helium atoms and a tiny, 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 tiny amount of the mass that is uh, released there is converted into pure energy in the, using the equation E for energy equals M for mass times C for the speed of light squared. So any amount of mass you have, you times it by the speed of light, which is 300 million squared. So three times 300 million times 300 million and you get the energy. So if you had one gram of mass times it by 300 million times it by 300 million, you get the amount of energy It's massive, which is why the sun gives out so much energy. So when you, again, this is another example though, of when you're looking at the sun and thinking, well, that's, that's hot, that's thermal energy. It's not, it's got much more nuclear energy stored inside it. It's just giving out energy as a heating or radiation pathway, which is what we'll move on to next. So this is our energy pathways. We've got four different energy pathways that we need to learn about. So um, we'll go top left to start off with. So radiation is energy traveling through a wave. So it's any type of uh, wave. So it could be light or sound. So our electromagnetic spectrum for the top here, uh, it's quite hard to see, um, but again, they'll come up in a different video. Uh, and again, it's something that links in to this. So some, this is why energy stores and transfers come up so much because they link into so many other things. So anything from gamma rays, which is done by radioactivity, through to X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, uh, going backwards, microwaves and radio waves all have all our transferring energy through a radiation pathway. Sound is another example. Okay, different type of wave. Um, but this is another example of a radiation pathway. Now, mechanical pathway is anything where energy is transferred through a force. If you physically move something, it's a mechanical pathway. So a bike chain, if you think about this, and this is what pathways actually are. This is where we'll get to this one before I explain this. So it's getting between stores. So you have your chemical store and you're pedaling your bike. And that's transferring energy to the back wheel to increase your kinetic store but if you look at the energy of each of the chain itself it's tiny okay the actual chain doesn't have much energy again with a wave a light wave doesn't have much energy but the sun gives out loads of light waves and you can build that energy up and you can use a solar panel to store it or whatever and again with the bike you can pedal and you're building up your kinetic energy in the in you moving okay the actual pathways, if you take a split second and you like take a photograph in time of how much energy it's got at that point, the pathway's not got very much energy. 
Uh, another example might be a pendulum swinging or anything that's gravity is the force that's pulling it down. So gravity, so it's up here, gravity pulls it down. Okay. So again, it's a mechanical saw because it's a force, because the force of weight or gravity is pulling it down. Right, heating. So any transfer through heat is via conduction, convection, or radiation. I'll not go too much into those. Um, but basically, this is anything where uh, thermal energy is being left lost from something or given to something. So via heating, this comes up a lot in the home. So energy escapes your house through heating, and you want to stop that by insulating your house as well as possible. And the last one, electrical, quite easy one, is the movement of charge. So electrons moving through a wire. So energy moving from a power station to your home through an electrical pathway moving from one side of the battery through to the light bulb through an electrical pathway okay now the electrons will flow because electrons are negative they will flow towards a positive charge part of like in the, in the battery to the towards a positive terminal we'll not confuse you too much today without a conventional current but that will come up later Okay, going to look at um, some of the more difficult questions now that you can get asked about uh, energy stores and pathways. So, first one, um, looking at describing the changes in energy stores. So, I'm going to go through this, um, highlight a few things and talk about what we need to put. So, it says, as the ball is dropped, it bounces back up again. Describe the changes in energy as the ball is dropped and then bounces and explain why the ball does not reach the same height as it was dropped. So basically what this is saying is you've got your ball, okay, and it's going down, starting up, so say it starts at this line here, goes down, hits the floor and bounces back up, but it doesn't reach the same height as it did before. So we're going to look at why that is. Now, when it's kind of planning this out, you want to think about what are the different points throughout this kind of the journey that the ball takes. So the first one will be at the top of the bounce. Okay. Then it's going to fall. Okay. So it's going to start at the top. It's going to fall. And there's going to be a change in energy as it falls. So it's falling. And then it's going to hit the floor. But when it hits the floor, it's going to squash and then bounce back again. So it's going to squash, then bounce back again. So it's going to hit the floor. But when it does so, it's going to squash. Right. And then it's going to go back up. But we need to explain why it doesn't go to the same height. So, looking at this now, I'll split those off. So when it's at the top, it should be quite simple, that's the first one. It starts off with gravitational energy. Okay, so gravitational potential energy. Then it starts falling, so its gravitational energy is transferred to kinetic. And when it hits the floor, because it changes shape, so it's going to be elastic potential energy. Okay. Now, when it goes back up again, the reason it doesn't go back up to its same height so we'll put on here actually on the plan it uh, and there's a reason for that so the reason being that when it's squashed some energy is or some lost as thermal okay so in the ball the ball is going to get warmer there's going to be thermal energy lost in the ball itself so, can I go through that now and what we would actually say? So you should find this out like this, but you need to write it yourself. So you would start off by saying, when the ball is at the top, 
it has gravitational potential energy. Now, really important thing that most people miss there, a lot of students when they write these sort of answers, write it goes from gravitational to kinetic to elastic and they don't say what the ball is doing or what is happening at that particular time. So you have to start off with the as when the ball is at the top before it's let go, it has gravitational potential energy. As the ball falls, this is transferred to kinetic energy. And you say when the ball hits the floor, it squashes, which changes its shape. So it has elastic potential energy and some is lost, some energy will be lost as thermal energy at this point. Then the ball goes back up, but does not reach the same height because of the lost, sorry, wasted thermal energy. I'm going to change that lost to wasted because energy can't be lost, can it? Okay, so some energy is wasted as thermal energy. Some energy wasted as thermal energy in the ball is also going to get air resistance as well, slowing it down. So if you put this into paragraphs now, so again, at the top, the ball has gravitational energy. As it's falling, it, it, this is transferred to kinetic energy. The ball then hits the floor, which changes its shape, giving it elastic potential energy, where some is also wasted as thermal energy. The ball then bounces back up, but it does not reach the same height because of the wasted thermal energy. So put that into your paragraph now and you should do the same thing for the next one as well. So just plan out the first main points that everyone's missing all the time is where is the ball? What is it doing? Or where is the object within the system? What is happening? Okay, we've got here, and this is the first of the difficult equation you've got in your little booklet. Um, so I'm going to go through with you how you do this one and hopefully you should then be able to do the other ones. So what you're going to need for this is on the front page of your booklet you should have already written down all of the different equations involved in the energy stores and pathways topic. Um, so first off, as always, we should read through the question. So we've got a ball is dropped, it's going to be important later, from a second story building, 5 metres, in the air. The ball has a mass of 120 grams. Okay. And it says if we ignore the effect of air resistance, I'm just going to highlight ignore. Uh, how fast should the ball be travelling as it hits the floor? So I'm going to highlight how fast. Right. Looking at this then, things I've highlighted, I've only got two numbers in there. I've got five meters, which is already in meters, so that's great. So that's a height. So that's the height that the ball has fallen. We've also got 120 grams. Now that isn't in kilograms, which it should be. So I'm going to divide by 1000 equals 0.12 kilograms. And that is your mass. So I've got a height and I've got a mass so far. Now that isn't looking great because I want to find the speed that it's travelling at, okay, or the velocity or the speed, and I've got mass and height, and, no, and those two really don't help me that much with that. I've also got there that it was dropped. So if it's dropped, it's going to be pulled down with gravity, which we know is 9.8 metres per second squared, or, sorry, wrong unit for this one. It is the correct unit, but newtons per kilogram. Okay, so if we're using those numbers now, we've got our mass is 0.12, we've got gravity is 9.8 uh, meters newtons per kilogram, and we've got a height is 5 meters. So now you look back to your equation sheet, and you don't look at which one am I doing to find how fast it's going? You look at what can I do with these three? Okay, and if you look at that carefully, you should find that you can put them into your gravitational potential energy equation. Okay, so we've got gravitational potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. Okay, so gravitational potential energy 
equals our mass of uh, sorry, put meters on there, kilograms. Mass of 0.12 times gravity is 9.8 times the height of 5 meters. And if you tap into your calculator, it gives us 5.88. So the gravitational potential energy is 5.88 joules. So if it hits the floor, and we are ignoring air resistance, then gravitational potential energy should be at the top and it's going to fall down should equal the kinetic energy at the bottom. So we now know that the kinetic energy is also 5.88 and we want to find how fast it's going and we know the mass. So if you look at your uh, kinetic energy equation Not 0.5 times mass times velocity or speed squared. We can work it out now. We can find the speed. We can find how fast it's going. Because if we know that the gravitation, the, sorry, the kinetic energy is 5.88 equals 0.5 times 0.12 times v squared. Now, what what you can do? Okay, so on this side, I can do 0.5 times 0.12. So I'll just do that. 0.5. Okay, that gives me 0.06. And then, because it's 0.06 times v squared equals 5.88, I can rearrange this. So because I'm times in on this side, I'm going to divide. It's going to be 5.88 divided by 0.06 equals v squared. Okay, so again, just do that. is 98 so V on its own is going to be the square root of 98 so V equals uh, and I'll round that um, yeah I'm going to round that to 9.9 .9. okay so and that's my answer at the end there. So when you're doing these, work out whatever energy you can. You probably want to end up with an energy. Then see what you can, if you can, you convert that energy into something else. Okay. So we've got step one, we've worked out the energy. Step two, we've said if it's got this energy at this point, it's got the same amount of energy at the next point. Okay, and then step three, we use that to rearrange to find what we want to find. So go through the other two answers, just look at what can I find out first, and that should then help you to work out, right, what can I then do? Okay.